Good afternoon, everybody. My number one priority uh, right now is doing everything that I can every single day to create jobs faster and to provide more security for middle class families and those trying to get into the middle class. And at this moment, that means making sure that nearly 160 million hardworking Americans don't see an increase in their taxes on January 1st. A year ago at this time, both parties came together to cut payroll taxes for the typical American family by about $1,000. But as soon as this year ends, so does that tax cut. If Congress fails to renew this tax cut before then, that same family will see a tax hike of about $1,000 a year. There aren't many folks, uh, either in the middle class or those trying to get into the middle class, who can afford to give up $1,000. Not right now. And that's why Congress must act. Although the unemployment rate went down last month, our recovery is still fragile. And the situation in Europe has added to that uncertainty. And that's why the majority of economists believe it's important to extend the payroll tax cut. And those same economists would lower their growth estimates for our economy if it doesn't happen. Not only is extending the payroll tax cut important for the economy as a whole, it's obviously important for individual families. It's important insurance for them against the unexpected. It will help families pay their bills. It will spur spending. It will spur hiring. And it's the right thing to do. And that's why in my jobs bill, I propose not only extending the tax cut, but expanding it to give a typical working family a tax cut of $1,500 next year. And it was paid for by asking a little more from millionaires and billionaires. A few hundred thousand people paying a little bit more could have not only extended the existing payroll tax cut, but expanded it. Uh, last week, virtually every Senate Republican voted against that tax cut. Now, I know many Republicans have sworn an oath never to raise taxes as long as they live. How can it be that the only time there's a catch is when it comes to raising taxes on middle class families? How can you fight tooth and nail to protect high-end tax breaks for the wealthiest Americans and yet barely lift a finger to prevent taxes going up for 160 million Americans who really need the help? It doesn't make sense. Now, the good news is uh, I think the American people's voices are starting to get through uh, in this town. Uh, I know that last week Speaker Boehner said this tax cut helps the economy because it allows every working American to keep more of their money. Uh, I know that over the weekend Senate Republican leaders said we shouldn't raise taxes on working people going into next year. I couldn't agree more. And I hope that the rest of their Republican colleagues come around and join Democrats to pass these tax cuts and put money back into the pockets of working Americans. Now, some Republicans who have pushed back against the idea of extending this payroll tax cut have said that we've got to pay for these tax cuts. Uh, and I just point out that they haven't always felt that way. Over the last decade, they didn't feel the need to pay for massive tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans, which is one of the reasons that we face such large deficits. Indeed, when the Republicans took over the House at the beginning of this year, they explicitly changed the rules to say that tax cuts don't have to be paid for. So uh, forgive me a little bit of a confusion uh, when I hear folks insisting on tax cuts being paid for. Having said that, uh, we all recognize that we've got to make progress on the deficit, and I'm willing to work with Republicans to extend the payroll tax cut in a responsible way. Uh, what I'm not willing to do is to pay for the extension in a way that actually hurts the economy. As Americans are well aware, this summer I signed into law nearly $1 trillion in spending cuts with another trillion dollars in cuts in the pipeline. And it would be irresponsible to now make additional deep cuts in areas like education or innovation or our basic safety net that are critical to the economy in order to pay for an extension of the payroll tax cut. We're not going to do that, nor are we going to undo the budget agreement that I signed just a few short months ago. Finally, with millions of Americans still looking for work, it would be a terrible mistake for Congress to go home for the holidays without extending unemployment insurance. If that happens, 
And then in January, they'll be leaving 1.3 million Americans out in the cold. For a lot of families, this emergency insurance is the last line of defense between hardship and catastrophe. Taking that money out of the economy now would do extraordinary harm to the economy. And if you believe that government shouldn't take money out of people's pockets, uh, I hope members of Congress realize that it's even worse when you take it out of the pockets of people who are unemployed and out there pounding the pavement looking for work. Uh, we are going through what is still an extraordinary time in this country and in this economy. And I get letters every single day, and I talk to people who say to me, this unemployment insurance is what allowed me to keep my house before I was able to find another job. This is what allowed me to still put gas in the tank to take my kids to school. We cannot play games with unemployment insurance when we still have an unemployment rate that is way too high. Uh, I put forward a whole range of ideas for reform of the unemployment insurance system, and I'm happy to work with Republicans on those issues. But right now, the most important thing is making sure that that gets extended as well. This isn't just something that I want. This isn't just a political fight. Independent economists, some of whom have in the past worked for Republicans, agree that if we don't extend the payroll tax cut and we don't extend unemployment insurance, it will hurt our economy. The economy won't grow as fast, and we won't see hiring improve as quickly. It'll take money out of the pockets of Americans just at a time when they need it. It'll harm businesses that depend on the spending just at the time when the economy is trying to get some traction in this recovery. It'll hurt all of us, and it'll be a self-inflicted wound. So my message to Congress is this. Keep your word to the American people, and don't raise taxes on them right now. Now's not the time to slam on the brakes. Now's the time to step on the gas. Now's the time to keep growing the economy, to keep creating jobs, to keep giving working Americans the boost that they need. Now's the time to make a real difference in the lives of the people who sent us here. So let's get to work. Thank you very much. What? to writing your stories, so I will um, obviously take your questions on the issues the President just discussed and any others. And I will uh, also, if I might, just note on a separate matter that tomorrow at noon the Senate will have a cloture vote on the nomination of Caitlin Halligan to serve on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. And uh, it is disappointing that a cloture vote is even necessary for someone as clearly well qual uh, qualified as Ms. Halligan who has bipartisan support from lawyers and law enforcement. Almost, after almost nine months of delay, we strongly urge the Senate's support and an up or down vote. Julie Pace. Thank you. Um, the President didn't mention anything about the new proposal from Democrats on the Hill today um, that includes almost everything he wanted on the payroll tax cut except extending that also to employers. Does he support their plan? Uh, first of all, I'm not sure has that been formally announced. It's. Uh, Right. I know it's been reported on by the Associated Press, so I don't want to get ahead of Senator Reid or Senator Casey. Um, it is certainly the case that we're working with uh, our colleagues uh, in the Senate, as we did on the proposal, the original Senator Casey, Casey proposal, which was voted on and uh, which uh, earned <coughs> the support of more than 50 percent of the U.S. Senate last week. Um, and we will work, as the President just suggested, with Congress to find a solution to this uh, important challenge, which is extending and expanding the payroll tax cut. Uh, and we'll obviously uh, look to Senator Reid and Senator Casey to lead that effort in the Senate. I guess I'm curious to, to see where you think you are in the process 
but I'll pop it back up. Um, do you think you're in a place right now where you have the support of many Republicans on the sheer idea of <coughs> extending the payroll tax cut, and you're just working on the pay fors, or are you still trying to get their buy-in on the need to well, extend? Well, I, I think that's a great question to address to members of uh, the Senate and the House who are Republicans, because while, as the President noted, we've had some indication from House and Senate Republican leaders that they now agree with the proposition uh, that independent economists have made clear is the case, that extending the payroll tax cut is uh, very important for economic growth and job creation, and that allowing middle class Americans to uh, experience a tax hike in January would have a negative impact on uh, not just them personally, but on the economy and on jobs. So. Uh, that's progress, but as we saw in the Senate vote, the rather surprising Senate vote on the Senate measure, uh, there seems to be an issue not with pay-fors, but whether or not it's even a good idea uh, to cut taxes for 160 million Americans, for working and middle-class Americans. Uh, to put it another way, which this clock illustrates, that we're, we're, we're coming down to it, the clock is ticking, uh, to the point where if Congress does not act, Act rather, middle class Americans, working Americans, 160 million Americans will have their taxes go up on January 1st. Uh, and I think what this clock uh, dramatizes is that uh, there isn't a lot of time and that Congress needs to act to do the right thing. And is the plan for the president still to have him focus more on trying to <coughs> sell this idea to the American people rather than get involved in the actual negotiations on legislation? Uh, look, I think the president. Uh, himself, as well as members of his team, will be engaged with members of Congress and, and key staff members to uh, uh, push forward the plan, to, to reach a conclusion, to, to, to get it passed and signed into law. I don't want to forecast what form of participation that will take in terms of uh, either the President or other members of his team, but you can be sure that uh, it will be uh, a concerted effort uh, at, at every level, both in terms of the public articulation of the President's views as, as well as the discussions with members of Congress. Yes? Um, how, how concerned are you about reports of voting irregularities in Russia, and what is the message um, you're sending to Prime Minister Putin and President Biden about that election? Uh, I believe Secretary of State Clinton uh, expressed the administration's uh, position earlier today with regards to the elections in Russia. We have serious concerns about the conduct of those de December 4th parliamentary elections. These concerns are reflected in the preliminary report issued by the OSCE's election observation mission, including a lack of fairness in the process, attempts to stuff ballot boxes, and the manipulation of voter lists, among other things. Equally concerning are reports that independent Russian election ob uh, observation efforts, including the nationwide Golas network and independent media outlets, encountered harassment of their personnel uh, and cyber attacks on their websites. We applaud the initiative that these and many other Russian citizens have taken to participate constructively, a positive development that the OSCE report also highlighted. Let's go to the back. Yeah, bless her. Can you believe it? <laughs> I'm in the holiday spirit. The Family Research Is everyone okay? <laughs> the Family Research Council and CNS News both reported a 93 to 7 US Senate vote to approve a defense authorization bill that quote includes a provision which not only repeals the military law and sodomy but also repeals the military ban on sex with animals or bestiality. Does does the commander in chief approve or disapprove of bestiality in our own country? I, I don't have, have any comment on I don't have any comment on that. Let me go uh, to another does question. Does the president believe Let's get to something this will more be serious? Yes, <laughs> I've learned my lesson, Jake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm done. Lester, I think we'll, we'll, we'll let everybody get a chance here. Go ahead, Jake. You don't want to take any more questions on bestiality? I'm wondering, uh, it, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you could explain what the U.S. Ambassador to Belgium meant 
uh, in his comments uh, about anti-Semitism <laughs> tying them to Israel's policy? The, uh, the fact is, as you know, we condemn this administration and the United States condemns anti-Semitism in all its forms and believe that there is never any justification for prejudice against the Jewish people or against Israel. Ambassador Gutman has expressed his regret, noting that he, quote, strongly condemns anti-Semitism in all its forms. And I would just point out, Jake, that this administration has consistently stood up against anti-Semitism and efforts to delegitimize Israel, and we will continue to do so. Our record on this speaks for itself whether it was opposing one-sided efforts to single out Israel at the Human Rights Council, speaking out against incitement in the Arab world, or opposing efforts to shortcut negotiations at the United Nations. Uh, specifically to your question, I think the ambassador himself has addressed this, so I would direct you to his statements. So in terms of interpreting what he meant, but our position is quite clear, and our record is even clearer. Did, did you? Of did, course I have, and I, and I think that- Does it represent the administration's point of view, what he said? The administration's point of view is what I just expressed, which is uh, we condemn anti-Semitism in all its forms and believe and there is- and believe there is. It. I think the ambassador has spoken on this, put out a statement about it, and, and our position, I think, is very clear. And I would point to you not just to our record against uh, opposing, rather, one-sided efforts to single out Israel, uh, speaking out against incitement in, uh, in the Arab world, or opposing efforts, Palestinian efforts, to short-cut negotiations with the United Nations, but also look at this administration's incredible commitment to Israeli security, which has been testified to by the Prime Minister and many others uh, in Israel. As far as you guys are concerned, is that the end of this controversy? Because there are a lot of Jewish groups who are very upset about <coughs> what Ambassador Gutman said. Well, I think that we have to look again at our clear position on this, uh, as well as our record. and. I think that I'm actually just talking about what he said, not your record. No, I, mean, I understand, but, but we're talking here about uh, you're only asking me because he, he, he's a, an ambassador and works uh, at the, out of the State Department for this administration, so let me be clear about what this administration's policies are, what its positions are. And what our record is, because that is what. The line, what your policies are well, in case you have an ambassador who's off the reservation a bit. Again, but he addressed his statement. And let me be clear about our position. And, and again, I, I quoted him because he's absolutely right when he says that he, uh, as well as this administration, strongly condemns anti Semitism in all its forms. All right. And, and in terms of how to pay for this middle class tax cut, the Republicans outlined a plan, uh, and I know you talked about this a bit last week, mm -hmm. but the Republicans outlined a plan in which um, wealthier Americans were asked to sacrifice <coughs> through means testing uh, social programs. Is that not, does that not meet the requirement of, of the wealthy paying their fair share? Well, I think two points about that. One is uh, that was a very small portion of the proposed means of paying for the payroll tax cut extension uh, in the Republican measure that went down uh, quite uh, uh, decidedly uh, with not even a majority of Republican votes. And the, uh, the, the it was a window dressing aspect of a measure that was paid for largely through unbalanced cuts that would force the reopening of the Budget Control Act, the agreement that the President and members of both parties uh, made just a few short months ago, and the President made clear his position on reopening that agreement. In fact, if I could just add that it is just, it is exactly what people get frustrated about with regards to Washington when leaders in Washington say, you know, this is my position, this is the, you know, I, I sign on the dotted line, you have my word, this is the agreement, and then a few months later that you want to either want to, you know, change the rules on the sequester or uh, change, uh, you know, violate or transgress in terms of the agreement on spending cuts, which I would point out, as I did last week, uh, the discretionary to spending cuts, non-defense to spend, spending cuts that have already been agreed to by this President and Congress would bring us to the lowest percent in terms of non-discretionary defense, or rather non-defense discretionary spending as a percentage of GDP since Dwight Eisenhower was president. So these are, these are, these are quite dramatic cuts, quite serious cuts, and uh, the inclusion of the measure that you talked about was a very small part of the Republican pay for. So it, it <coughs> meets the requirement, but not enough? Well, it certainly doesn't meet, the, it doesn't, success, it doesn't sure. pay for it. <laughs> So it's not enough to pay for a payroll tax cut. I'm not saying that it's not, uh, I don't want to negotiate the particulars of an end game or get ahead of 
Senator Reid and Senator Casey in terms of their proposed um, compromise uh, or new measure to, to extend uh, and expand the payroll tax cut. But uh, while that measure does ask uh, in some ways, small ways, wealthier Americans to uh, pay their fair share or at least a little bit more, it does not in and of itself any come anywhere close to paying for this uh, tax cut. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Jay, Speaker Boehner is expected to put out his <coughs> proposal uh, later this week. Mm -hmm. After that, do you expect to negotiate with... Time's running out. <laughs> do you expect to negotiate <laughs> with the House and the Senate? Uh, yes, I, I think that we can expect uh, that... Goodness. <laughs> Sorry, no, that's quite all right. I hope, I hope your camera's okay. Um, the, uh, this administration, this White House, will be working with leaders of both houses uh, as, uh, to, to get this done. There is really not a lot of time to waste here. It is essential for the health of our economy and out of fairness to 160 million working and middle class Americans to get this done. So then if the clock is really ticking, why not negotiate now? Well, let's be clear. This, we, we are working with Congress. Uh, just because, as you know from the summer, we don't announce every conversation or every meeting uh, of the, that the President has or his senior team members have, doesn't mean we're not working this issue. And in fact, we worked it hard, which is how we got, we got the votes that we got last week. Uh, and I will remind you that the Senate Democratic measure, which the President supported, got a majority of the U.S. Senate, including a Republican vote. The Senate Republican measure, which was put forward by the Senate Republican leader, got, I think, 20 Republican votes, or maybe 20 votes overall. So we are pushing this. And if it weren't for the President's leadership, we might not even be debating this. Congress might not even, at least the Republicans in Congress, might not even be taking up the issue of payroll tax cut extension. Going forward, we will continue to push it. It is not without our participation that uh, our friends in the Senate are moving forward with a new measure to extend and expand the payroll tax cut. But so they're, they're Democrats. I mean, are you in substantive conversation conversations Again, with Republicans? I don't, I don't want to and won't read out every meeting I, or conversation that we have. Read it out. I mean, is there we we do have conversations with uh, Republicans, yes, on this matter and others. And then just a quick question about <coughs> the FAA administrator uh, Randy Babbitt, who was mm -hmm. arrested this weekend for DUI. Uh, what was the president's response? Uh, the president was informed of this uh, in the last hour, as as, any, as everybody in the White House, as well as at the Department of Transportation, were made aware of this uh, just in the last hour or so. Uh, he didn't have a particular reaction. It was just uh, passing on this information. My understanding is that Administrator Babbitt has requested effective immediately to take a leave of absence from the FAA. Secretary LaHood has accepted that request, and Deputy Administrator Michael Huerta will serve as acting administrator. He had no reaction? Uh, it was in the run-up to this, and you know he, he reacted as you might expect. Is that without pay or what? Yeah, I would uh, <laughs> refer you to the Department of Transportation. Can I follow him, actually? Uh, sure. You can follow him. <laughs> <laughs> Will President Obama be asking for his resignation? I think that what we have at this point, uh, in terms of a matter that just came to light uh, within the last hour or so, uh, we have Ad Administrator Babbitt requesting his own uh, leave of absence. And for further disposition of this matter, I would refer you for now to the Department of Transportation. Yeah. Uh, on Iran, we have a missing military aircraft that crashed in Iran. Um, how badly damaged was the aircraft? Uh, I would refer you for questions like that, and pretty much all questions on this matter, to uh, ISAF and the Department of Defense. Not, nothing on that. Um, well, I mean, it depends on the question you ask, but I'm not going to get into details about uh, the aircraft or other issues involving the incident itself. Well, the Iranians say they shot it down. Do we deny that? Again, I would refer you to ISAF. Can I ask you about the President's uh, speech tomorrow? Why is he channeling Teddy Roosevelt? <clears throat> well, because uh, President Teddy Roosevelt, Theodore Roosevelt, gave uh, an historic speech uh, in uh, Osawatomie, is that correct? Osawatomie, Kansas. Uh, it's one of those words you've read, but you're not sure you've ever pronounced. So uh, uh, 111 years ago, if I'm, uh, if I'm correct in my calculations. And the point that the President is making by speaking in the same location 
uh, and is that the ideas that President Roosevelt put forward about the need for uh, Americans of all kinds to get a fair shot and a fair shake uh, are very much at issue today. And the President's speech will uh, encapsulate the debates that we've been having this year over our economic policy and over our economic future. Uh, so he thinks it's an opportune time and an opportune location to really um, try to put into broader perspective uh, the kind of debates we've been having and the issues that uh, are of vital importance to building an economic future of this country, in his mind, uh, that gives middle class Americans the kind of fair shake and fair shot that they deserve. And who has not given them a fair shake or a fair shot? Well, I think it's abundantly clear and, and was clear even prior to this uh, most uh, recent economic crisis that the middle class in this country has been squeezed for a long time and most especially in the last decade uh, and in the decade rather prior to this president coming to office. So uh, this has been an issue that has animated this president uh, even before he was sworn into office. It was really the reason why he ran for president as he articulated many times in the 2008 campaign. Uh, and it is the focus of his work here in office, the need to do everything he can through Congress, through his executive uh, authorities to help the middle class uh, expand and um, help those who aspire to the middle class gain access to it. And that's the focus. That, and look, if you step back, the, the speech will, will encapsulate and, and, and uh, provides context to the debates we've been having uh, this year and that we will continue to have. Uh, but it really, it, it even, it goes to some of the specific issues that we're talking about now, the, 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 the absolute necessity and fairness of extending and expanding the payroll tax cut for middle class and working Americans. You the said this need to, uh, to have the Senate confirm Richard Cordray as the consumer watchdog because Republicans have made pretty clear that they don't oppose him personally, but they're going to try to block his nomination uh, in order to prevent uh, the Consumer Protection Bureau to, uh, from having all of uh, its authorities to take action to protect consumers. And we passed that legislation, this president fought for that legislation precisely because consumers deserve uh, protections that they did not have, uh, as became so abundantly clear in the financial crisis that led to the worst recession since the Great Depression. You use the word, sorry, just more on um, this is an issue that has animated the president. He talks a lot about it and has, ha has recently. Can you identify specific, specific areas where the president has been able to act in the past three years that has helped this wage gap that you talk about, where the, the middle class has? I mean, well, I think that. Where has he succeeded in, in what we decision? What we know is that when he took office, we were on the precipice of an economic calamity, the likes of which um, the, which could have been even worse than the Great Depression. People were predicting, economists, sensible outside independent economists were predicting uh, global economic collapse, unemployment as high as 25 uh, percent, complete collapse of the financial system, perhaps the need to nationalize the banks, et cetera, et cetera, the decimation and elimination of the domestic automobile industry and many other industries. Um, the result of that, including, of course, the 25 percent unemployment, would have been you know you're enjoying this, Jay. Come on. I'm sorry, on. I have to the, uh, I'm just running out of Ed. Would have been. <laughs> I apologize to everyone in the room. I'm not hurt. <laughs> I, I'm not hurt, but I will not stop. The, uh, the, uh, let me just finish my thought here, which is that everything this president has done on the economic front has been uh, focused on uh, giving middle class Americans the economic security that uh, they have lacked now for a substantial period of time and which uh, has been um, even more sorely in need because of this great recession. Yes. Can you recite some of the great things of President No. <laughs> oh, yes, <laughs> yes, I can. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I was just getting started. How difficult it was when he started taking Yeah, how hard was it really? <laughs> was he facing a challenge? He inherited a, no. Um, there could be a quiz about how, uh, how many jobs we lost in January of 2009, anybody? Very good, 750. Seven, very good. Uh, how much uh, GDP contraction fourth quarter 2008? Anybody? 
8.9%. Bloomberg. Revisions, revisions. <laughs> yes, more and more accurate as. No, I, I think I think Al Hunt is getting a phone call about uh, downplaying the recession over in uh, Bloomberg Corner. Yes, sir. Can I ask you about the payroll tax cut? Follow up on some of the some of the answers you gave before. You were basically saying I don't want to get ahead of this emerging compromise, and that's consistent with what the White House has said, both on the payroll tax cut extension as well as going back to the super committee. Mm -hmm. They've got to work this out. You've defended the president not calling Republican leaders over here because he doesn't need to get in the nitty gritty. They had to deal with all that stuff, then he would deal with it at a later date. So tell us, how does the president coming to this podium and beating up on Republicans for five minutes, basically saying they don't want to extend unemployment benefits, they don't want to help people about to have their taxes go up, how does that help you get a deal? <laughs> what the president has made clear is what he believes is essential and what, uh, what his red lines are, if you were, in terms of uh, what kind of compromise would be acceptable and what wouldn't. The fact is, Ed, and it's, it's not necessarily a happy fact, but it's a true fact, that um, simply by putting forward his ideas and, and his name on those ideas and saying to uh, members of Congress that he'd like to negotiate with them, they are not going to necessarily compromise and respond. That has been, unfortunately, the fact for these nearly three years. Well, you know, what the has Republicans were saying they had not even seen this compromise yet. They hadn't even had a chance to react to it. The so how can they be accused well, wait, wait, of not embracing was, it? The president was reacting not, not not to a compromise that hasn't been proposed yet, as I understand formally, or, or a new a new a new force are still up a new Senate, knows the details. A new Senate Democratic version. He's he's also reacting to the votes we just had on this issue, which demonstrated uh, a profound reluctance by Republicans in the Senate to extend the tax cut for middle class Americans. Uh, and, and because of that, and, and a, res a refusal to accept the majority vote of the Senate, including a Republican senator, uh, and let that uh, measure move on to the House and be signed into law by the President if it passed the House. I mean, so the, the obstructionism here is real. And what he is hoping through uh, his articulation of his views on this issue, as well as more, most importantly, the articulation expressed in the voices uh, raised of the American people on this issue that Republicans will move, that Congress will act and get this done because it's the right thing to do. About two or three weeks ago, that Senator Durbin and other Democrats defended the president for not coming out and giving his red lines on the super committee deal by saying, Republicans warned Democrats on the Hill. The president comes out here and attacks them. This thing's going to blow up. So how then do you justify no, no, coming no. out and First of all, you're, no, that's they're, what, they, they're that's what, Senator, Durbin what said. Senator Durbin said is that the reason there, there, there was a strategic uh, I notion behind the approach that the administration took on the super committee because it was made clear by Republicans involved in these negotiations that anything that had the president's name on it as a potential compromise uh, would become toxic to Republicans who refuse to vote for anything that they view as a victory That's for the president. The president so, not coming out and being more aggressive on the super so, committee. Yeah. First of all, the super committee is, is a different beast from the payroll tax cut extension. This, after all, is about tax cuts. And, I, you know, You've been here a long time. A lot of folks have been covering this a long time. If there has ever been a truism in modern American politics, it's that Republicans are always for tax cuts. And what is striking to this president, as he made clear moments ago, and to me and to others, is that Republicans seem so grudging in their support, to the extent there is any support, in giving tax cuts to regular Americans, to working class Americans, to middle class Americans, to 160 million Americans. And, and their refusal in unison virtually, except for one Republican, to back a payroll tax cut expansion and extension uh, for 160 million Americans because they didn't want to ask 300,000 millionaires and billionaires to pay a little extra. I mean, I don't think there's anything more clarifying than that vote. So uh, having said all that, we have to get this done. And the President came out today to make his views on that clear, and he looks forward to working with Republicans in the House and the Senate, as well, of course, as Democrats to get it done in a way that uh, is economically responsible. Mr. Thrush. Jake, just to follow up on Ed, uh, uh, there's a school of thought that goes, uh, the president does better in these negotiations when he's actually not in the room, that when he gets in the room with these guys, uh, they start changing the rules of the game, uh, they start dealing with internal uh, dissension in their own ranks. I mean, is there, from a process perspective, an advantage in the president remaining outside of these direct negotiations as long as possible? Well. I just want to go back to what I said to Ed, because there is no uh, global doctrine, if you will, about how you approach these things. 
and each issue is different. And what I think is quite clear is that this president, throughout his presidency, has been uh, intimately engaged with Congress on his agenda, whether that's uh, deficit reduction or uh, economic growth measures, job creation measures, health care reform, or other measures. And he will continue to be so. The fact is that, as you know, this summer he was uh, very directly involved on a day-to-day and, and at times hour-to-hour -hour basis with Congress, Republican leaders as well as Democratic, on the debt ceiling negotiations. The point I was making to Ed is that uh, in the super committee process, uh, the President uh, took an approach that was designed entirely to maximize the possibility of a positive outcome of putting his views on paper in detail uh, to the public and to the committee at the beginning of the process. And then stepping stepping back and letting a congressional process take its course. And How does this one compare in terms of the President's direct engagement? How will this one compare to the debt ceiling negotiations and the well, super committee? Well, I think it will be different as all these issues are different. It is also obviously a different animal, if you will, a payroll tax cut extension and expansion is a relatively Def, uh, modest if proposal compared to a broad three or four trillion dollar deficit reduction package. But uh, the President, his team will be engaged uh, in these coming days and weeks uh, in a variety of different ways working with Congress to get this done because as the President just made clear, um, we can't afford to let that clock go to zero. Uh, the American people cannot afford to have their taxes go up on average a thousand dollars come January 1st. The other thing is you are targeting, uh, we had a conference call yesterday, you guys are targeting uh, seven states, some of them pretty deep red states on the payroll tax with uh, interviews with local news anchors and such. Has the President thought of calling people like Rob Portman and Olympia Snow directly rather than using this indirect approach to pressure? I, again, I, it, it, you, you are presuming in your question that we read out to you every communication that the White House has with the Hill, and I can assure you that we do not. Um, this is a multi-pronged uh, uh, effort, if you will, that there are many fronts here uh, on which to fight for middle class tax cuts, and we will continue to do so. And often in, the an in answer to questions about whether conversations have occurred, I will say that I have no conversations to read out to you, which is my answer in this case. Alexis, and Agent, then Laura. Agent, the President met with Secretary Geithner today, and Secretary Geithner is going to Europe. First question is, is there any new message the President wants him to carry? to Europe to try to uh, work with allies abroad. And second question, can you tell us what Jennifer Palmieri will be doing and what she'll be adding to the staff that the President doesn't have currently? Uh, as you know, the President uh, asked Secretary Geithner to travel to Europe this week for meetings with his counterparts uh, on their efforts to reinforce the institutions of the Euro area. Uh, this, is in, this is rather part of our continued engagement with Europe and an important uh, moment for them, and as you know, Europe's success is of great importance to us, uh, and we have uh, shared ideas and observations where it may be useful based on our own experience, uh, and we will continue to do so. So this is this is the continuation of a process that we've been engaged in for many weeks and months now, in particular Secretary Geithner, but also the President and other members of his team. Um, I would say, uh, with regard to Jen Palmieri, that she's going to be a welcome addition to this uh, White House staff and communication staff. Uh, she has a uh, big shoes to fill, or rather small shoes to fill with Jen Psaki's, but uh, she's, we're going to, uh, you know, that, that, that position has been vacant and uh, it's, a, it's a valuable uh, and important position that needs to be filled, so we're looking forward to her arrival. Yes? Thanks. Um, in the interim, I think since you were first asked this question, Senator Reid has in fact announced his mm -hmm. proposal, so I'm wondering if you could give us your take. We were trying to <laughs> get this briefing done you before that. You pushed it back by, by quite a bit, but not quite far enough. Uh, look, I mean, broadly, we we support. You would not be surprised uh, the efforts of Senator uh, Senators uh, Reed and Casey to get this done, to get this payroll tax cut expansion and extension done, uh, and um, to have it paid for in a way that is responsible and fair. Uh, the president pointed out, and I think it's uh, always worth remembering that the sudden heartfelt concern that you hear among some Republicans who are reluctant to give tax breaks to middle-class Americans uh, that it needs to be paid for is uh, a little out of sync with the position that they've taken on tax cuts for these uh, many uh, 
years now, uh, and in particular with regard to the this uh, House uh, Republican leadership, uh, they've institutionalized the idea that tax cuts don't have to be paid for. So um, that having been said, the President believes that we need to be uh, mindful of our fiscal issues. That's why he proposed a measure in the American Jobs Act to pay for all of it, including the payroll tax cut expansion and extension, why he supported the Senate Democratic version, the original one, uh, which paid for it in an in a economically sensible and fair way, and why uh, we support this uh, latest proposal. What you just said, of course, the president also said that he made the point that Republicans That's suddenly, yes, not, not a coincidence, that, that Republicans suddenly are feeling the need to pay for this when they don't, haven't paid for other past tax cuts. He also said that he's willing to find a responsible way to do, to offset the cost. Mm -hmm. But is it, given the differences over the offset right now, and given the history that you've both recounted, is it your preference at this point but, uh, to just go ahead and no, not our, pay for our it? No, our preference, the President's preference has been very clear about wanting to pay for it and pay for it in the way that he thinks is responsible. And I would just uh, ask you to think about your question when you said the differences in the uh, pay-fors. Republicans got almost no support for their proposals in terms of how to pay for it from their own members. So now I don't know uh, what that tells us uh, in full, but I know it, it indicates that the issue here isn't so much about pay-fors, it's about whether or not we're going to let this clock go to zero, whether or not there is any real um, uh, profound support among Republicans in the Senate and the House for extending tax cuts for middle class and working Americans. The vote that we saw last week on the Senate Republican proposal suggests uh, that that feeling is not there, which is, uh, which is a shame. But given that there is isn't sufficient support to pass the Democrats' preferred pay for, would it? A good second choice be just allow it to pass without it being offset? Well, the fact is Senators Reed and Casey have put forward a new proposal with uh, different pay-fors uh, or modified pay-for, and, and we remain hopeful <laughs> that Republicans in the Senate and then eventually in the House will uh, hear the voices of the American people who are making quite clear that they um, need this tax relief and that the economy needs this tax relief. Economists, independent economists, have made clear that not extending the payroll tax cut would have a negative impact on economic growth, would have a negative impact on job creation, and that expend, extending and expanding it would have a positive impact, that we would uh, be able to uh, continue the, uh, the growth and job creation that we've seen and expand it which is exactly what this economy needs. It's the medicine this economy needs. Last real quick thing. In the past, you haven't been all that excited about these countdown clocks. In fact, you've been discouraged the them in the have, past. The I'm just issue we had, no, no, let's different. be clear. The issue we had with the debt ceiling countdown clock is that it was sending a, 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 a it could have a negative impact in raising the, the, the specter, which we hoped uh, would never be raised of the United States defaulting on its obligations, which would have the impact, if it were to come to pass, of causing global economic chaos. Um, this is quite different. This is about whether or not 160 million Americans, working class, middle class Americans, are going to have their taxes go up on January 1st because Congress refuses to act, or rather, in this case, the Senate and House Republicans refuse to act. Roger. Um, and then. Thank you. Uh, I know you said you weren't in the habit of reading our conversations, but could you at least say whether the president talked to congressional leaders over the weekend? I don't have any conversations to read out to you, Roger. All right. How soon does this tax cut need to be paid for? Uh, what what this president has made clear in his uh, proposed methods no, of paying not, for is no. that we need to do this uh, over time so it's economically responsible. Uh, that was uh, embodied in his proposal for the American Jobs Act. It was also embodied in the Senate Democratic proposal, and I believe is original, and it was embodied or is embodied in the current one. Uh, and going to the point the President made from here just moments ago, uh, we, we should not pay for it in a way that harm, does harm to the economy, does harm to our recovery. Uh, so that's very important, and that's one of the principles that he brings to this discussion. Does that mean like over five years? Well, yeah, I, don't have, I, I think that what, what is uh, important is that we don't do it in a way that actually uh, does harm to the economy or does harm to the very people that will be helped by a middle class tax cut. So um, we also, and I think the President made clear, that we're not going to 
reopen the Budget Control Act and reopen the deal that um, has already brought us down to spending levels that are lower when it comes to non-defense discretionary spending uh, than we've seen since uh, Dwight Eisenhower was president. Yes. Jay, and can then, you read out a meeting okay. with college folks? Let me do I promised. Uh, Thank you, Jay. Yes. And then. Uh, so, um, the, the Kenyan Prime Minister Harper will be in town uh, with, in the White House mm -hmm. uh, Wednesday afternoon. Is that right? That is it correct that there will be the signing of a new border security agreement? I think I was asked this the other day, and I don't have anything new on it uh, for you uh, in terms of what specifically uh, the uh, two leaders will will talk about or what acts they might perform in terms of. But that might be a more than just that it's a good partnership and we want to. Uh, well, we'll, we'll see. I don't have anything new for you on it today. Uh, Mr. Jackson. Jay, can you read out the meeting with the college presidents this morning and what that was all about? Uh, I don't have a, uh, a detailed readout. I wasn't able to make it. The uh, I think the general idea is that um, among other issues, I mean, this president is profoundly concerned with education. Uh, he's also very concerned with uh, the cost of education, especially higher education. Um, so I'm sure that was a topic, but um, I had to miss that meeting and I don't have a readout for you. But we'll have one, I am assured by uh, Mr. Ernest. We will have one for you later today. Chris, last one. Uh, Jay, I want to follow up with you what I asked you about earlier about the lack of federal non discrimination protections for LGBT, LGBT people in the workplace. The President supports legislation known as the Employment Non Discrimination Act that would address this issue, but he can also take administrative action. He can issue an executive order saying federal mm -hmm. dollars won't go to contractors that don't have their own non discrimination protections mm -hmm. based on sexual orientation and gender identity. If the President supports legislation to address this issue, why, what's stopping him from issuing an executive order that would move toward the same goal? Chris, I, I, I don't have anything new for you on that, uh, so I don't have uh, uh, probably an answer that um, will move that story along for you, but uh, if, if you want to ask me, uh, I can look into it for you. Thanks.